Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews. And, um, uh, uh, no, the, these shadows are not doing it for me. Uh, can I get some light over here? Uh, oh, right. The solitude. <laughs> We will discuss what we do in the shadows. In the light. This 2014 New Zealand film is truly a unique beast. It's a vampire parody that's actually good. Really, really good. Which is kind of rare for vampire films in general, let's be real. But for a comedy? The problem with most vampire parodies is they're shallow, condescending to the genre and its fans, feature caricatures of vampires, or provide no insightful commentary on specific underlying social issues of vampire tropes. The makers of what we do in the shadows obviously understand vampires and all the literary metaphorical baggage that comes with them. They say that vampires' hearts are cold and dead. Definitely dead. It features developed poignant characters who take themselves seriously. And it's that contrast with the absurdity of the premise that brings the humor. When they do funny things, it's coming out of character. Not as a cheap joke of, ha ha, look, a vampire is doing something dumb. I don't want to spend too much time comparing it to other films because that's a whole discussion for another night. But here's a quick example. Take a look at this clip from Dracula Dead and Loving It, or as I call it, Mel Brooks' worst film. <laughs> Why is this funny? Because Dracula, Dracula, the supposed almighty king of the vampires, gets a window slammed in his face. That's not supposed to happen to Dracula, ha ha ha. It's silly, but it doesn't mean anything. It's insult degradation humor, making someone who's supposed to be formidable look like a fool. But what does that really have to do with vampires? Also, it's something that happens to him, not something he does. Compare to this. When this vampire, as a bat, accidentally slams into a car, it's awkward and funny because haha, <laughs> he kinda sucks as a vampire when he's built himself up to be such a badass. But also, in the context of the scene, we know he's upset, and that's probably why he's flying badly. We know he's been struggling with his identity, we know that there's stuff going on in his unlife that makes this awkward moment all the more of a personal blow to his ego, especially as he does it himself. This will make more sense once I get into this character shortly, so keep it in the back of your mind for now. The other bit to this is the CGI face. Is it supposed to be funny because it looks so dumb? But what does that have to do with Dracula as a character? Compare to this. Vladislav used to be extremely powerful. He could turn into all sorts of animals, but now he never gets the faces right. This vampire has emotional issues that affect his transformation, and that's why the face is like that. His fall from grandeur is what's funny. Also, it occurs in the film at what should be a high-tension scary moment, and that reversal of expectations is what makes it hilarious. This isn't a serious moment, so the face is just random. I like Mel Brooks, but I don't think he really cares that much about vampires. What We Do in the Shadows, on the other hand, was a passion project for comedy duo Taika Waititi and Jemaine Clement, and it shows. The only way to do parody well is when you're making fun of something you love and truly understand. And it touches on so many vampire tropes. Like this one, for instance. Are you a virgin at all? What? I think we drink virgin blood because it sounds cool. For some reason, pop culture has decided that vampires prefer virgin blood. But where does this even come from? In folklore, vampires usually went after their own families. And Dracula drains a ship full of sailors, definitely not virgins. Lucy probably was, but Mina's a married woman when he goes after her. At least she was in the book. The movies like to change that. Why? 
There is no good answer. Or is there? I think of it like this. If you were going to eat a sandwich, you would just enjoy it more if you knew no one had fucked it. The film is a mockumentary in the vein of Spinal Tap, and they did write a script for it, but actually refused to show it to any of the other actors or crew. So it's almost entirely improvised, and they shot like 130 hours of footage that they edited into a 90 minute movie. So you know only the best of the best made the cut. They actually made three cuts. One focused on story, one focused on jokes, and then the final one, which was the best combination of the two. And it is so much fun. Multiple award-winning filmmaker Taika Waititi's Two Cars One Night was nominated for Best Live Action Short Film at the Oscars in 2005. And you'll know Jermaine Clement from such equally brilliant and prestigious endeavors as... Equally brilliant. They've been making comedy together for over 20 years, and What We Do in the Shadows started out as a micro-budget short film in 2005. I suppose you want to know my story. They wanted to expand it into a feature from the start, but it took them nine years to manage it. And as we all know, the landscape of vampire media changed a lot between 2005 and 2014. Thanks largely to the Twilight franchise and everything that rode on its coattails. People thought vampires were hot. Definitely people uh, rolled their eyes when we said we were making a vampire film. As soon as they heard the first syllable of the vamp, it, it was like, <laughs> it's, it's Even it. I did. Back, back in 2010. The landscape change worked to their advantage in some ways, as people were ready to make fun of vampire tropes again. But you would also not believe how many times I've heard people surprised to learn that it's actually a comedy. They assume it's just another vampire movie trying to cash in on the craze and dismiss it. But no, you guys, this film is great. These guys were lovingly making fun of vampire tropes before Twilight, and then incorporated the changed pop culture landscape into the final product. The film's premise is that vampire roommates living in a small New Zealand neighborhood welcome a documentary crew into their unlives, and we learn that being a vampire isn't glamorous, like, at all. The comedy comes from the juxtaposition of vampire tropes against the mundane, everyday middle-class life in the modern world. Out in the light of night, they do sexy, sinister vampire things. But what do they do in the shadows? Dishes, apparently. This is bullshit. The original short film is much less subtle about stating the theme. Being undead is, it's, it's the same as being alive, except that every part of you is dead. But the comedy here goes much deeper than a one-note fish-out-of-water joke. Each of the deeply fleshed-out characters battles their own internal struggles of how to fit into the world. A common vampire theme is one of isolation of being cut off from humanity. And this film explores it better than many non-comedies. The different flavors of pathos for each individual character is what makes it work on such an effective level. And the emotional arc is one of overcoming loneliness through brotherhood and friendship. The film starts with Taika Waititi as Viago, who is styled after your classic Anne Rice, elegant, beautiful vampire. He was an 18th century dandy. Here, um, let me fix that for you, obvious post-error. Only instead of being brooding and anguished, he's downright adorable. Look, a ghost cop. He's the mothering, caring member of the household with a sweet nature that makes us instantly forgive the fact that he's a blood-drinking creature of the night. Hello, ladies. Somehow, he's managed to survive hundreds of years despite being so charmingly inept. On the upside, I think she had a really good time. He's so sincere. It's their last moment alive, so why not make it a nice experience? There's a disconnect here, and the fact that the audience is just expected to roll with it, and does, is a vampire trope to deconstruct in itself. How can he be murderous but unrepentant? And we still find him lovable and relatable? Are humans just not people to him? This disconnect is a huge part of the loneliness of the vampire. 
existence. And Viago's loneliness stems from an even more personal tragic backstory where his human servant's mistake caused him to lose his true love. When they're reunited at the end of the film, we're happy for him despite the fact that we have seen him gorily slaughter people. But he's just so nice about it. Taika Waititi describes this comedy of politeness as a very New Zealand thing, and ties it into a culture of insecurity that has to do with living on the edge of the world. And this characteristic extends even into Jermaine Clement's much more brutish character, Vladislav. I was known as Vladislav the Boker. Vlad is inspired by Gary Oldman in Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 Bram Stoker's Dracula film. His pretension of toughness makes him all the more pathetic as a character as we come to learn how far he's fallen from his vampire glory days. He suffered a terrible defeat that sapped him of his self-assuredness and affected his powers. We find out at the end that this defeat was being dumped by his girlfriend, another powerful vampire. Unlike Viago's lovelorn loneliness, Vlad's is one of emasculation and self-depreciation. He mentions at the beginning he only uses his torture chamber when he's in a bad place. The fact that he has a torture chamber should horrify us, but to know he's growing and healing and putting it behind him makes him relatable. Then, when we see him using it again later and know he's fallen into a bad place, our heart goes out to him. He's ultimately the most pathetic of the vampires because at the end he gets back together with his ex and is repeating his cycle. He seems pleased for the moment, but... We know he is doomed, and this is the tragic fate of the vampire. Peter is an 8,000-year-old vampire that looks like Nosferatu, who lives in the basement and doesn't talk. Haha, <laughs> it's funny, because the classic scary vampires kept in the basement, oppressed beneath the antics of these modern sexy vampires. Except he seems pretty okay. As the most alien and inhuman of the vampires, he's the only one who comes off as genuinely frightening at times. But he is given enough of a character to make him lovable and kind of adorable as well through his relationships with the other characters. And we're still friends today. He understands and respects his roommates, even though he communicates differently. And when he dies, it feels like losing a friend. <laughs> I'm coming, Victor! Deacon, no, it's... I'm coming for you! Deacon here is the youngest member of the household, and they describe him as a bad boy. Because he doesn't do his roommate chores. <laughs> Hilarious! Seriously, though, he is a terrible roommate. Deacon? I will do my dishes! Do that, do that. I've seen some people say his character is supposed to be referencing the original novel Dracula, or even Bella Lugosi, but I, uh, I don't see it. In that way, he's the most original of them. Though he's from the mid-1800s, he spent some time in World War II as a Nazi, and this makes him the most irredeemable member of the group. It's one thing to be a murderous, blood-drinking creature of the night. But a Nazi? They actually wanted to cut this joke from the final edit of the film. Because, you know, but they said they didn't have anything to replace it with and therefore had to keep it. And if you were a Nazi vampire? No way. So, how do you make a former Nazi relatable, if not likable? Well, he knits. And Deacon also has the greatest emotional arc of the story. His friendship with Peter is built up so that when Peter dies, he's the most upset about it. And his rivalry with Nick is also the basis of the most character growth. The plot arrives to the film in the form of Nick, a brand new vampire who brings along his human friend Stu, who introduces the roommates to modern technology. Though everyone loves Stu, Deacon especially dislikes Nick. He feels replaced by the new cool young bad boy vampire who's actually in touch with the modern age, but copies Deacon's sense of style for some reason. Remember that clip I showed you at the beginning? This is all the emotional stuff that's going on with Deacon when he crashes into the car as a bat. We feel bad for him, but he's also being pretty pathetic. And it's the deadpan absurdity of such an undignified thing happening to a guy who's going through emotional turmoil, but who kind of deserves it, that just makes it all the more hilarious. He only has himself to blame for his issues with Nick up to this point. The animosity reaches a climax, though, when Nick is indirectly responsible for Peter's death, and Deacon feels vindicated in banishing him from the family. But then, later, they're brought together again when Stu dies. 
Everyone grieves for Stu, and this shared tragedy leads Deacon to feel a connection to Nick, and he comforts him. Unlike Vlad's sad cycle of regression, we see genuine growth in Deacon's character. There is hope for his redemption in his relationship with others and the changing world around him. Maybe Deacon gets compared to classic Dracula because he has a Renfield-like slave, Jackie, and he's pretty terrible to her. Also, clean the bathroom, please. With blood everywhere, it is gruesome. Jackie is the only main female character in the movie. In such a classically dude-soaked genre, this is part of the parody, and she even directly comments on it. All I'm saying is that, um, you know, if I had a penis, I would have been, I would have been bitten years ago. She's a fascinating character to have in a Renfield-like position, though there are plenty of vampire fans who might fetishize being a vampire slave. She isn't like that at all. To her, it's a means to an end. She wants to be. A vampire. In oldie times, the thought of anyone wanting to be a vampire was considered insane. And Bram Stoker demonstrates this through Renfield being literally mentally ill. It's unclear in the original novel whether Renfield was ill beforehand and Dracula merely took advantage of it to make a slave of him, or whether Dracula's supernatural powers actually drove Renfield mad. But the end result is that he is violently insane and wants to be like Dracula. When he does have moments of lucidity, he is against Dracula and wants to help people destroy him. Contrast this to modern times when people regularly fantasize about how awesome it would be to be a vampire, despite the costs. Lots of people fantasize about this for hours a night, year after year. Why would someone like Jackie want to be a vampire? We're shown she has a normal seeming life, a husband and children, a home. One might observe this and assume she should be fine, happy even. This is excellent commentary on perception and assumption. Just because we see a woman in such a socially accepted fine position, we think she must be content. Well, considering she wants to be a vampire so badly that she's willing to endure degradation and commit such amoral atrocities, she's obviously not content. And really, we shouldn't require any kind of tragic explanation for us to accept this. Maybe you can't understand why she's feeling a sense of powerlessness and incompleteness that she thinks being a vampire would solve for her, but she is. Accept it. You don't know her. I don't know her. We don't know what's going on in her heart and soul, what she's suffering just because she has a house and kids and a husband. You don't know. In the end, when she gains the power she desires, we feel she is finally satisfied. And that's the important part. This may not make her likable or redeemable, but there's no denying it's relatable. The humor in her art comes from her triumph, not any condescending idea of such a disaffected housewife character deserving to be punished for daring to want more. I mean, if I had to guess why Jackie feels desperate for power, I'd say it probably has something to do with the patriarchy. You know, just based on her comments. Like one big circle just biting each other's dicks. Dick biting club, and I'm stuck here ironing their fucking frills. Existing as a woman in this world will do that to you. Should we judge her for being an irresponsible parent, for putting her family in a dangerous position? It's hard when you want her to reach her goals and triumph over Deacon. She's just so sympathetic. And also, after having seen Nick's arc in acclimating to being a vampire, we know she's in for a rough ride that will make her grow as a person. Twilight! It's through Nick's journey that the central theme of the film is most obviously stated. I'll say, I'm over being a vampire. It's shit. So don't, don't believe the hype. Being a vampire kind of sucks. It may seem awesome at first, but really, it's pathetic and lonely and heartbreaking. What do they do in the shadows? Wow, fun. And even when Stu introduces modern technology, it seems to help at first, but then there's this part. They're it's just a... bad shit, Holy man. shit. And this is my favorite joke in the whole movie, by the way. Just leave me to do my dark bidding on the internet. What are you bidding on? I'm bidding on the table. Vlad is languishing on the internet, using it to cut himself off even more from society. From his friends. The technology is only making his loneliness, his isolation, worse. 
And I think the point the film is making about this spiral of tragedy, this how the mighty have fallen feeling is even more relevant after the Twilight craze. So I'm kind of glad this film took nine years to make. The horror of becoming a creature of the night should be obvious to empathetic humans, but after so long of pop culture glamorizing vampires, perhaps we needed to be reminded. By the time they finally finished the film, people were burnt out on vampires, but that made it mean so much more with that burnout to comment on. Vampires get burnt out of themselves. You think you're burnt out after half a dozen years of the craze? Think how it feels after centuries. All they have are themselves and the little family they've created. The older vampires are all these European characters who have been driven out of their homes, out of their times, as far as the end of the earth. New Zealand, into this ironic roommate situation. It's an immigrant story, which is another classic vampire theme. But whereas Dracula was a novel more in line with the fear of foreigners coming to our shores, what we do in the shadows is a celebration of brotherhood and the internal dynamics among people who live in the margins and have trouble fitting in. <laughs> Topical. It's, it's the same as being alive Stay dead, stay dead, stay dead. You're dead and out of this world. Things you should do tonight. Go watch What We Do in the Shadows. Seriously, there is so much more to this movie that I didn't even begin to touch upon. It's easy to find, just Google it. And then like this video, subscribe to my channel, leave me a comment, and support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all my Patreon patrons. I literally could not do this show without you. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and now I will go do some things in the shadows. Probably laundry.